This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. You're listening to The Morning Run with Lynn and Shouning. 7.17 in the morning, Tuesday the 19th of May. And uh, we have quite a jam-packed day uh, here for you, actually. And uh, later on uh, at 12.30, there's something very special happening. Yeah, it's a webinar, the latest thing in the COVID-19 <laughs> era. Everybody does it because, you know, we can't get together, but doesn't mean we can't do it online. So today's webinar is going to be about the MC. Has MCO thanked your investments? Uh, where do you go from here? So join Riga and Sense presenter Roshan Karnison and of course our one and only BFM founder Malik Ali today. They're going to be speak to financial planners on ways to manage the red in your portfolio and what your options are going forward. That's happening at 12.30pm live on BFM's Facebook page. Catch it. Catch it, catch it indeed. Now, in about half an hour as well, we're going to be speaking with Bridget, uh, Dr. Bridget Welsh, Honorary Research Associate at the University of Nottingham's Asia Research Institute, to help us unpack what went down during yesterday's parliamentary sitting. But right now, we're taking a look at the subject of foreign direct investment to Malaysia, because recent developments like COVID-19 and the trade war between the US and China has made many companies realise they maybe need to move away from relying on China uh, for its supply chain. So this was why countries like Vietnam and even Malaysia Malaysia, to a lesser degree, were previously touted to be the beneficiaries of the trade war. But just because Malaysia may be poised to benefit from these developments doesn't mean automatically we will, because the reality is that we still need to compete with countries in the region to attract foreign direct investments. So for more on this, we have on the line with us Carmelo Ferlito, Senior Fellow at the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning, Carmelo. So in your opinion, how should Malaysia position itself as a business destination in order to benefit from companies looking to redirect their business out of China? Good morning. Um, first of all, uh, Malaysia, of course, has always uh, uh, played a very important role in attracting uh, uh, FDIs because of uh, a good institutional framework, uh, good infrastructure, good education. Um, now I think that uh, Malaysia can still play a role, but cannot simply rely on uh, uh, the good work that was done in the past uh, because um, the neighbor countries are becoming more aggressive. And uh, I think that Malaysia needs to change radically um, its communication strategy toward uh, foreigners and foreign business in this moment, if they want to take a chance of attracting FDIs. But, uh, you know, the question is COVID-19 has moved the trend from globalization to self-reliance, right? Because we did realize that uh, global supply chains became disrupted. Now, isn't this trend actually negative for Malaysia, which has in the past been a net exporting nation? It is definitely negative, and uh, it is negative not only for Malaysia. I mean, international trade happens because uh, it is beneficial for everyone participating in the game. Otherwise, we would not have that game. And uh, Malaysia uh, not only has been an expo- a typically exporting country, but Malaysia considered that relies for um, 70% of imported food. So Malaysia heavily depends on other countries also for basic needs uh, like like food. So Malaysia needs to be very careful in uh, playing the autarkic game. But in terms of uh, policy around lockdown exit strategies, you know, how do you think Malaysia has fared in comparison to some of our regional peers? Well, you mentioned exit strategies. I think that the strategies probably... Uh, the the word that is uh, more missing that we feel more uh, that that is missing uh, around uh, the world but also in, in the region uh, with regard to the lockdown policies um, somehow we are going out but uh, um, I think that uh, there are a lot of contradicting messages uh, while probably um, Thailand has been more effective in communicating a strategy. Um, Indonesia is still uh, in doubt on what to do. Uh, But surely in Malaysia, I think a certain degree of confusion is not helping. Uh, but the question is, if we take an approach where we open for businesses without restrictions, right, uh, which is something Thailand is maybe doing because they're looking at tourism, I think the concern is that there is a risk of a second wave of infections. And some would say that the economic consequences of this will be even greater than during the first wave. I think that uh, we have to be very realistic and look at the numbers. Most probably with reference to Southeast Asia, 
we even cannot talk seriously of a, a strong first wave of COVID-19. Um, we should look beyond our belly and, and see what happened in Southeast Asia with COVID-19. Um, we have in Southeast Asia something like 10% of the world population, but only 0.69% of the COVID-19 death. And the people that died of COVID-19 are 0.0003% of the population. So uh, I, I think that we, we are not facing a real emergency. Uh, in countries like Malaysia, the, 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 the medical system, the healthcare system is not under stress. So I think that we can risk a little bit more on that side because the, the damages that are coming out of the lockdown are far greater than uh, the damages brought in by, uh, by the virus itself. So, Carmelo, in, a com- in a column that you wrote recently, you mentioned that a climate of confidence is key to attracting FDI. Could you illustrate how not just policy, but policy communication plays a role in affecting business confidence and how the government could potentially improve on this front? This is a very important point because it, it is not enough to tell to the companies that they can restart production. Um, they need to be confident in restarting, but confidence is also important from the consumption side. If uh, people are not confident to go and buy product, uh, there is no point for the production uh, to restart. We have seen in Malaysia, in example, some members of the government saying, OK, you can restart, go ahead because we need you. And we had other members of the government say, listen, but if you don't comply as Uh, We are uh, with our SOPs. We are going to fetch you, put you in jail, shut down your operations and messages uh, of of this kind that brings businesses away. So I think that uh, where we can improve um, uh, is uh, uh, where we what we should do is to have uh, the prime minister probably take leadership on the communication, uh, be the one in charge of mediating between the messages coming from different ministries. Because in in this moment, uh, what is really playing bad is is the conflict between the, the messages coming from different ministries. But the reality is that we do need some standard operating procedures, right? Because life cannot return back to normal. That's that's a fact. Uh, so how do you balance these two between, you know, you want to operate a business, but you want to also ensure some sort of uh, healthcare standards? Well, I, I'm not really sure that life cannot go back to normal, also because, uh, again, so far COVID-19 in Malaysia has killed less people than the dengue fever, and the, ca- the cases are much less than the dengue fever. So... Um, we should a little bit reconsider the narrative. But having said that, I think that uh, um, the government in, uh, in designing guidelines should design general guidelines, not um, too uh, detailed guidelines. Because uh, doing business, um, the businesses are, are very different in realities, in size, in operations. And we should uh, trust uh, business people and business owners in uh, in using common sense. We should appeal to their common sense uh, in order to to do what is best um, for their company, but also for their people. But Carmelo, we know that businesses always want to maximize profit, right? So they might just ignore whatever seems like common sense and not practice, uh, you know, I would say physical distancing. And the point is, we did have very low death rates because our health uh, ministry and our government were very strict, was very strict in the initial days of the lockdown to really flatten that curve. So my concern is we take our eye off that ball and we allow a second wave and we don't have any SOPs, wouldn't the consequences be even greater? First of all, I I think that where Malaysia played well was not really in the lockdown, but in the fact that Malaysia has a very strong healthcare system compared to the uh, regional standards. If you look at countries like Thailand, they had a much uh, lower uh, mortality, but with a much lighter lockdown. Philippines had a higher mortality, but with a much stronger lockdown. Uh, Indonesia and Singapore had the same mortality for million people. So. Um, I, I don't think that is really the lockdown that played a difference. Again, I'm not saying that we should not uh, uh, adopt some SOPs, but these SOPs need to be 
general guidelines, not, uh, not something, because if you try to find a solution that is applicable to every kind of business, then you become mad because businesses are so different that a general universal solution doesn't exist. So given certain guidelines, then you should allow uh, businesses to find their own way uh, within these guidelines and eventually try to control that businesses comply with these guidelines. Thank you very much for speaking with us this morning, Carmelo. And that was Carmelo Ferlito of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. Uh, of the opinion there that uh, considering Malaysia's performance so far in flattening the coronavirus pan- uh, pandemic curve, that we can afford to take uh, a few more risks in perhaps restarting our economy. Yeah, it's always going to be a challenge mm-hmm. between balancing uh, you know, the need to have an economy versus everyone's health. But I, I have a little bit of hesitation here because I'm not sure businesses, unless you give them some SOPs will know in the first place what to do. I think common sense is not that common, you know, sometimes <laughs> and what applies to me might not apply to you. Uh, so yeah, I think we still need to have some general uh, guidelines. Otherwise, I'm not sure whether even as a consumer, I will have that confidence to go out and shop or go out and eat or buy something, you know, or be in that mall unless I know that there's something specific. Absolutely. And it's a very uh, unenviable position that governments around the world are in right now, trying to balance, uh, trying to trying to navigate the space. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, you've got a highly infectious uh, global pandemic. On the other hand, you have the threat of your economies stalling over the next uh, uh, next one to two years. Uh, but right now, uh, we have the 7.30 News Bulletin coming up for you. Don't forget to vote on the poll we have running on the BFM Twitter account. We're asking you which of our political coalitions seems more stable. Is it Pakatan National? Is it Pakatan Harapan? Let us know what you think. Up next, we're speaking with Michael Shubridge at the Australian Strategy Policy Institute on the latest developments between Australia and China. That's happening after the news. Stay tuned to BFM 89.9. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.